Hello, this is Keith Kaiser with another lesson from God's Word. We're doing Luke's Life of Christ. Today we're in Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Luke 18 and verse 9. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Our Lord has been talking about eternity, and specifically eternal dwellings. We saw in the first parable in chapter 18 that the one who expects to be with God in heaven, or indeed who expects anything from God, has to be persistent in prayer. We remember what Hebrews 11 says, that he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this is the marrow of faith, so to speak. Through all ages, the uh, richness of faith has come from those who believe God exists, and also that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That it is worthwhile forsaking this world to gain God, and the effort of seeking him while he may be found, is amply repaid in eternal life. Now, when we think about this parable, there's even a more striking requirement here, that the person who approaches God is not even just good enough to pray. Persistent prayer is essential and necessary. But in this parable, there are two men that are both praying, but with very different attitudes. And the problem is that the Pharisee comes with exactly the wrong sort of attitude. Our Lord uh, sets it up, or the Holy Spirit using Luke, I should say, sets it up in verse 9 by saying, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So there's two real errors that are made here. First of all, they think of themselves as righteous. When Romans 3 and other scriptures remind us, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah says we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Later, Romans 3.23 says, for, we have, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then the second fallacy here is that they despised others. In other words, they devalued other people. They thought other people were of less worth than themselves or less important to God. And we have to understand every human being from the cradle to the grave, from the infant in the womb to old people that are now uh, into tremendous health problems, that they all have value before God. They're creatures made by God, created in the image of God, and they're valuable to him. Not only are they valuable by right of creation, but by right of redemption, the Lord counts all human life as valuable. And so for this man to come and think he's righteous and others are less than himself is indeed a twofold fallacy that the Lord puts right through this parable. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now on the face of it, those were very different uh, societal groups. The Pharisees, as we've seen before, were religious conservatives. They were people that strove for outward righteousness, that strove to follow God's law. And in their efforts to follow God's law through the centuries, they had added extra laws to God's law. And so not only did they affirm that they followed the scriptures, that they followed the Bible, but they followed the traditions of the fathers, what their rabbis had passed down to them. Uh, when in point of fact, however, time and time again, the Lord Jesus showed that their righteousnesses were as filthy rags, that this carefully cultivated righteous facade was really a sham. And the Lord pulled off the mask and revealed them to be hypocrites, as in this case. So for all their profession of righteousness and their pretensions toward possessing righteousness, the Pharisees were sinners like everyone else, sinners in need of a Savior. 
And of course, there's always the danger of Phariseeism that we can look to our own works and look to our own religious attainments, so-called, uh, the things we believe and the creeds we hold to and so forth, and think that because of our religious labors that somehow we've earned a righteous standing before God. And a righteous standing before God is essential for salvation, but it is something that comes not through merit, not through what we deserve, not through our works, but it comes through grace, through faith in Christ. So we're given it as a free gift. And as Romans 4 reminds us that the reward is not reckoned of debt uh, by works, but it's reckoned of grace through faith. And so that's the principle on which God declares men righteous. It's believing in the righteousness that he has established and given through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to have faith in Christ who loved us and died for our sins on the cross and rose again to give us that free gift of righteousness before God. Now, this Pharisee was there, but the other man was a tax collector. And people would think, well, these are diametrically opposed camps, that the two men couldn't be more different because the tax collector was not someone who troubled himself so much about the law or about God's word. In fact, he was a shyster. He was willing to cheat people out of uh, what their hard-earned gains and their money and whatever he could get. The tax system in their day wasn't regulated by just laws. It was a franchise system that the Roman Empire told the tax collectors, now we want to give an amount for this city or for this jurisdiction, for this area. You get that amount and anything you can get over that, that goes into your pocket, so to speak. So people like Zac um, like um, Zacchaeus that we meet later in chapter 19, uh, he's a head tax collector. He has lesser tax collectors, probably people like Matthew who sat at the toll booth who collected certain taxes here and there, but he had collected a lot and gotten ill-gotten gains. So when he comes to Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's very keen on showing his repentance by paying restitution, by giving back what he had stolen. Now, this tax collector, therefore, would have been viewed as a collaborator, someone who worked with the Roman authorities. He would have looked as someone that was morally suspect and probably an outright thief uh, that had his hands in many people's pockets unjustly. But we see the attitude of the coming of these two men was very different. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, which is interesting. His prayer isn't said to be going up to God. It isn't said to be a prayer that delights in the Lord. This man prays with himself. He's not concerned about thy will be done. He's concerned about praying for what he wants when he wants it and, and sort of talking to himself. His prayer is basically a monologue where he's addressing things as he sees them. He doesn't really care about God or God's word or what God has to say. This is how he sees it. And he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. So who needs the judge of the universe when you've already prejudged that you're doing just fine, that you're a good person? And so many of us have that mistaken notion about ourselves that we think, well, I'm basically a good person. And uh, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. Again, in Romans chapter 3, quoting the Psalms. So uh, the Lord assures us that our goodness has to proceed from God, not from ourselves. But this Pharisee didn't get that. Why did he think of himself as good? Well, again, it was a twofold error. Number one, he thought of his own works righteousness. He said, I thank you that I'm not like other men. So there was this comparison with others. And then the other thing was he thought about all the things he did. So firstly, I'm not like others. And then secondly, look at all the good I do. And many people think they're good on those same grounds today. They say, well, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a perverted person. I'm not a person into drugs or a person that's violent. And so I'm basically a good person. When in fact, goodness is defined by the scripture as loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And this is a digest, a way of saying in two sentences, basically what all the law of Moses said in the Old Testament. And it, of course, declares each one of us to be sinners. The law shows us to be transgressors. It's like a spiritual thermometer that shows us we're sick 
and that we need the Savior. So he thought he was doing pretty good because he was comparing himself with others. He's not like others. He's not an extortioner. He's not unjust. He's not an adulterer or even as this tax collector. So he's uh, kind of considering some of the usual suspects, some of the people that were indisputable sinners, people that society would have said, oh yeah, these are bad folks. I mean, you think about extortioners, those that violently take from others, force others to give them money. You think about the unjust, I mean, they're not interested in a square deal. They're not interested in treating people appropriately. They want to cheat people and they aren't con concerned with justice or fairness. Adulterers taking someone else's spouse or even, he says, as this tax collector. He says, I fast. Now here comes his positive works in verse 2. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. So 10% of what he was going to give uh, he uh, of his property rather he would give and so the tax collector standing afar off he manifests a different attitude but think about that pharisee a moment he says i'm better than the tax collector i'm better than these other folks and i can prove it look at how i fast look at how i pay the right amount of money now the problem is for outward uh, ceremonies and works like fasting doesn't mean that inwardly your heart is right before god and outward things like paying your money, of course, doesn't earn anyone favor before God. There are still so many people in Christendom that go to church and they put money in the offering and think that somehow they've bought some righteousness from God. Sorry, God can't be bought off. God demands perfect righteousness. And the only way to get a perfectly righteous standing before God is to have that which the Lord Jesus offers us, the righteousness of God through faith. And so if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus, no matter what you do, no matter what works of righteousness which you do, they will not earn your salvation. And no matter how much you compare yourselves to other people, the judgment is you. What have you done with Christ? What have you done regarding God's word? And none of us can say we've perfectly kept what God tells us to do in his word. So we need a savior. We need the Lord Jesus. And as long as you're without the Lord Jesus, you're living in unbelief. You're hardening yourself against the savior, the provision that God has made for sin. Now, the tax collector, in spite of his outward societal position as uh, an ostensible sinner, a real terrible sinner, uh, here the tax collector, he comes and he manifests a very different attitude in verse 13. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. So think of that body language. I'm not even good enough to look up to heaven. You know, the cherubim that were on top of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle and later the temple, they would have their eyes pointing down to the propitiatory, to the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. And they had two wings that were covering their eyes. In other words, not from their peripheral vision nor their direct vision were they going to look at God in his intrinsic holiness and unveiled glory. But they were looking to the blood, that which enables creatures to approach God. Fallen men and women and boys and girls can have their sins put away by the blood of the right sacrifice. The right sacrifice being not a blood, the blood of bulls or goats, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, bulls and goats and lambs and turtle doves, these were all brought as sacrifices, but they were pictures of what was going to come. And the one who would offer the right sacrifice was the one whom John the Baptist called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1.29. So like those cherubim, imagine holy angel, angelic beings in heaven, like them, the tax collector won't even lift up his eyes. Say, I have no right even to look up to where God is, is sort of the body language. And what's more, he beats his breast. This is a sign of mourning. It's something that we read later in the Gospels. People that were observing the crucifixion of Christ after the Lord died on the cross, they would beat their breasts. There was this pounding on oneself, a, a gesture of mourning, a gesture of uh, being upset uh, at the situation. Uh, and so 
Here, this man does this. He doesn't lift up his eyes, but he's beating his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. A little more literally, the word he uses there is, God be propitious to me, a sinner. Now, propitiation is the thought of the right sacrifice that enables God to judge sin, but to forgive the sinner. It is the sacrifice that is offered as a substitute to the sinner falling under the judgment of God. And so he's saying, God be propitious rather to me, a sinner. It is God's mercy, his kindness coming to us through the sacrificial provision that's been made, that sin has been paid for, that justice has been done because the righteous anger of God against sin, his punishment and wrath upon it, has fallen not upon the sinners, but it has fallen upon the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself knew no sin, the Bible tells us. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says about him. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, there was no guile found in his mouth. So imagine there was nothing in the interior life of the Lord Jesus in thought, word, or deed that was sinful or iniquitous before God. Sin is lawlessness, and this is the one who fulfilled the law. He always obediently kept the law of God. He said, I always do those things which please him. So even beyond the law, as it was stated in the Old Testament and the prophecies of that Old Testament, the Lord fulfilled all of those things or shall fulfill the parts that are having to do with his second coming. But the Lord has done all things well. And when he says that he does always those things that please the Father, of course, it includes dying on the cross to be that propitiation for our sins. So the tax collector comes not pleading his own worth, not saying, look at all the good things I've done, not comparing himself to others and judging himself by other people, but he just basically throws himself on God's mercy and says, if you're to have mercy on me, it must be out of the propitiation that you yourself have set forth, the sacrifice that you have made that enables me to approach you and to come to you. Now, prior to the cross, they were looking forward to that sacrifice to be made. It was the credit card principle, if you will. A uh, credit card pays for something, anticipating that the real payment will come later. It's a symbol of a payment to be made. But after the cross of Christ, nowadays we look back and we say, yes, the price has been paid. The Lord Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. And so this man uh, comes to God, not in virtue of who he is or what he's done. He throws himself on the mercy of God, looking to who God is and what God has done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus himself, who's the judge of all the earth and the one who's going to reign over the world one day, the one who's going to judge the world in righteousness, Acts 17 says. John 5, he says, the Father has committed all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. And here's his judgment on this man in verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Justified means declared righteous. He was seen as righteous in God's sight rather than the other. So God, too, makes his comparison. And he says, you want to come to God and be declared righteous? Come saying, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Come saying, not of works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to thy mercy thou hast saved me. Come saying, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not what I've done, but what God has done in Christ. He's reconciling the world to himself through him. And so that man was justified, but the other not justified. Because if you come saying how good you are or talking about all the good you've done, that, of course, is an affront to a holy God. It can never efface one sin you've committed. It can't erase the past, nor can it satisfy the righteous claims of God. And what's more, it is an insult to God who gave his son to save you. If you're coming by any other way to God, you're saying, I don't care that Jesus died. The death of your son means nothing to me. I won't obey him. I won't bow the knee to him, trusting in him alone. He is not my Lord, and to me, he's not the Christ. And that's a very great offense and a blasphemy. And that will damn us to hell if we don't repent of it and turn to the Lord. He says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So people kind of balk when they hear the gospel of Christ. What? 
It says that I'm a sinner. What? It says I'm not good enough on my own. What? It says all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They don't like that. But if you humble yourself like this tax collector did, the Lord will exalt you. You'll be exalted with Christ because when Christ saves a person, he takes that man or woman, boy or girl, and he begins to work in their life by his Holy Spirit to conform them to his image. And when he comes to take them to himself, even their outward bodies will be changed into glorious bodies like his body, Philippians 3 and 1 Corinthians 15 and other passages tell us. And then we will rule and reign with the Lord. We'll share in his glory. So just as he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, the bride of Christ, the church, composed of every true believer who's trusted in the Lord Jesus alone for salvation, will rule and reign with him, not only for the thousand-year millennial kingdom, but we will go into the eternal state, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I hope you humble yourself today, if you never have, and say, God, be propitious to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me on account of what you did through your son, the Lord Jesus, and on account of who he is for me, the risen son who's entered into heaven to be my mediator, the one mediator between God and man, and to be my great high priest, the one who ever lives to make intercession for me and to point to the good of the sacrifice he offered, which is better than all the types and shadows of the Old Testament, because this sacrifice only needed to be offered once and never needs repetition. Thank you for listening.